Welcome to a new episode of Talking About Rules. Today's guest, Gerard Arsenal, BWF Empire, Badminton Panam Empire Assessor. For today, uh, our presenter is Gerard. He, Gerard is a BWF Empire and also Badminton Panam Empire Assessor. So Gerard will be in charge of the of the meeting today. Gerard, welcome and good evening for you. <laughs> yeah, good evening. Uh, good evening for almost everybody, unless you're, I don't know which part of US or Canada or part of the world, basically, or America you are in, but uh, it is evening here. It is 8.02. Uh, so yes, it is evening. Uh, just as a reminder, maybe if you let me, uh, Ricardo, uh, it's, um, uh, if you click on participant at the bottom, then you can see that you can raise hand. And uh, if you have questions or anything like that, please use that button so we can know if you have a questions and uh, the order of the people uh, will be there. So we know who raised their hand first and all that. So that will help with uh, the process of this, uh, uh, this little uh, chat that we're gonna have here. Uh, thank you all for showing up. It's, uh, it's showing me also that you guys are interested in Bamington and you are also uh, involved either directly here or even indirectly in your own countries and in, in, in different parts of the world. So thank you for being here. I'm going to share my screen. So this is what we are uh, going to talk about today, umpires and service judge instruction. If you want to look at that, there is a, it is an 81 page document. I don't expect and to do all of that today. Uh, we are going to go for about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. And, uh, and then wherever we are going to be at in this document, that's where we're going to stop for today. And then, and then, uh, save some of those for uh, the next week. So I, uh, you might find it funny that I'm not looking always at the camera or at that computer. I have two screens, so the, my presentation is there and I have you guys on that one. So uh, Ricardo, you will need probably to cut me off uh, if you see questions uh, and who is uh, I, and who is, and I'll let you handle that. If that's okay with you? Yes, uh, I will be paying attention if somebody raise their hand and also in the chat box will be taking note of who is talking. Yeah. And if I don't answer. see that here, so if they, um, if they have a question in the chat note or, or raising their hand, just let me know and you can read the question or something like that and then I, I'll do my best at answering you guys. Okay. okay I don't you. have all the answers. And the answers that I don't have, I will find for our next meeting. That said, uh, the instructors, instruction is for, of course, uh, the umpire and the service judge. And it has been developed by uh, a BWF team. The first draft of this uh, has been done by uh, me, Eric Desroches, and Jean-Guy Poitras. Uh, some of you might, might know Jean-Guy Poitras. And, uh, and then it was passed to BWF and they did a bunch of little tweaking to it. So uh, I know uh, a lot of this, but not all of it by heart because they, they did do a little bit of tweaking on that little adjustment. As you can see, there's a man very serious there. If you have him as a service judge, you better be ready. And you have him as an umpire, as a service judge, you better be ready also. He's quite serious. He's like that all the time also. I know him. It's a little bit scary. Uniform is the first part of, uh, of this uh, lesson. Of course, the appearance of the service judge and the umpire is very important. You have to wear, wear in your case, your Pan Am uniform, unless you're BWF, and then it would be your BWF uniform. Although, uh, as you may know, many of the tournaments that you go to, uh, you are uh, issued a tournament shirt, and that's the shirt that you would wear uh, at that tournament. And at BWF, 
everywhere we go, almost, they give us a shirt. They get us card to put in our pocket, but every time we go to a tournament, there's no pocket. We complain every time. I guess it's the $2 extra that they can't pay at BWF to give us a shirt with a pocket. Uh, uh, every cent count. Uh, so you have to wear your BWF umpire uh, shirt or whatever shirt they give you at the tournament. Of course, it, the, you need to wear also a black trouser, or like I call them pants. Uh, ladies, you can wear a skirt. I don't like the way this is phrased there. It seemed to say that female, sh it, it is preferred to wear a skirt. Although all the tournaments I've went to, I don't see a lot of skirts. So if you feel like you want to wear a skirt, you can ladies, but if you want to wear black trouser or black pants, you're more than welcome. I've seen much more black pants and black, uh, a skirt on the court from uh, female umpires. One thing is sure, uh, sure though that you there's no jean and no casual wear there and also you need to uh, wear smart black shoe. I've never met a pair of unsmart black shoe but if ever I do one day I, I, I would like to meet unsmart black shoe but they need to be smart. Basically that means uh, they won't appreciate like a pair of, uh, I don't know, Nike uh, high boot shoes or something like that or something in this value. Dress shoes, I think, is our preferred. Although I've been to tournaments and they gave us black Yonex shoes and therefore then we have to wear those black Yonex shoes. Any questions so far, Galdo? And no, Gerard. Continue. That's how good I am, you see? Yes, yeah, all good. Yes, all good. <laughs> but if uh, if you do have a question, don't hesitate, uh, Ricardo, to cut me off here and let me know. Yes, don't worry. I, I'm working on that. Thank you. Umpires, uh, before your match, of course, off the court before you even get on court. Uh, umpire service judge together with the line judge, you need to uh, gather in the assembly area and they would, they would like you there 15 minutes before. And you need to be 15 minutes before, you need to be sure that you have all your people there as an umpire. And uh, you need to be sure also to have your full uh, line judge. Sometimes you see line judge there, but you're missing one or something like that. It is your responsibility as an umpire before you go on uh, that you have everybody there. If you're missing someone, you let you have to let people know that you're missing someone. Each court will be uh, will have designated entry and exit location. This you will see at the briefing from the referee at the beginning of the tournament before the first day. You should have had a briefing from the referee telling you and explaining you uh, how to get on and off court, which door, which entry, uh, which direction, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, you should know also which side of uh, the net is considered the uh, table side or the side of the referee's table. I've seen tournament that I've went to that there is referees on each side everywhere in the hall. So because it's big country, big uh, hall, uh, four different referees, they sit at all sides. So you need to be sure that you know that because when you arrive on court, you need to stand on the side of the referee's table. So you need to know where that table is. Um, and that is something that is not there, but I just said. Ensure that all members of the technical official team are aware of these location also. You need to be, uh, be sure that uh, all line judges know where and how to get on court. And that should have all been said in the briefing by the referee before the tournament starts. Prior to walking on court, 
uh, with the other court official uh, and the players, you have to be sure that the clothing of the players comply with tournament regulation. As is, the, the referee will instruct you if there is any change to those regulation. Uh, and if you see something that it is not uh, recommended by BWF or recommend or uh, okayed by the referees of the tournament, you need to be able to report that. Uh, you can ask the player to change and if they don't want to change or, or say that they're fine, uh, then it's the referee decision that you need to call the referee there to make that decision. And, and then if the player still doesn't want to change, then there's all steps, but that will be covered in another lesson. Same as all the regulation regarding the clothing itself, all the, the, the little uh, rules about size, lettering, uh, number of, of advert on shirt, uh, shorts, socks, uh, everything. That will be covered in another uh, session. If not already covered because I missed the first one. Uh, if you have a mobile phone, be sure to turn that phone off because you know that if the mobile phone of a player uh, sound when the play's on, you know what you have to do. So I, I can tell you that uh, if I'm evaluating you guys and the phone starts to go next to the court, it's really not good news. It's, it's really bad news. So, so remember to turn that phone off. Now before the match on court again, when you're off court, uh, to assist with the correct announcement. Uh, you need to be able to, as much at the best of your abilities, to uh, pronounce correctly, um, announce the player's name properly. So you need to uh, check uh, with your either other service judge that would be, or line judge, or uh, other umpires that are from maybe the country or that they know that player and they know how that player wants that name to be pronounced. Uh, my suggestion is to write the name of the player in your own language or sound just to be sure that you say it correctly when it's time for you to announce the player's name. I have uh, stories that I asked the player what uh, I mentioned his name. He says, no. So I mentioned his name again. He says, no. He tells me his name. I say his name back and he says no again because my accent was not correct for him. Okay. So then I asked him to read my name and, he, and then when he read my name on my score sheet, then I said, no. <laughs> And then he retries again, and I say no. Okay, and then he looked at me, and he went, ah, okay. We understood each other. One thing you have to be careful about, though, I went on court in a major tournament, and I asked the player's name, and I asked other umpires their name. And when I walk on court and announce the name, everybody, 10,000 people, start laughing when I said the name of the player. So that can be very, um, uh, putting lots of anxiety. It can makes you nervous. You have to forget it, okay? You can't go back on it. You say it the best of your ability and then you keep going. But try to get it as much as possible like uh, the player wants it to be said. Try to. By writing it on your own score sheet, at the best of your abilities, with the sound in your own language, usually you can get pretty close to what it needed to be. Again, before the match, under the expression given, uh, the umpire should lead their team onto the field of play. So the, uh, you are in front, you're leading as an umpire. 
usually the order that you guys go in is umpire, players, service judge, line judges, and court attendant. So it will always be like that unless otherwise announced by the referee. In a major tournament, and maybe some of you guys been in doors tournament be, uh, also, sometime they let the officials go on, and after the officials are on court, then they introduce the players. So that's, that would be a variation that we see very often. The players would uh, come on after, in, and sometime even uh, one side, and then like a 30 seconds later, then the other side would come on. They even separate the two sides. So you can get mentally ready for that also if you haven't lived that already. Uh, remember, and this is something that we watch as assessors, uh, the speed that you walk on court. You don't want to lose people. When I gathered with my line judge and service judge in the back, I always check. I have situation and I see people on screen here that I know they had that situation uh, also before where you have a line judge, for example, who uh, would have walking uh, difficulties, like even maybe with a cane. I've seen that before. So you have to adjust the way you walk on court so you allow everybody to stay together and don't have this big gap in between. So this is something that you have to watch. Of course, you need to walk on court in a professional matter. You need to walk. You can't start waving at everybody on your way. You don't walk like a cool guy walking on yo-yo. No, you walk professionally on court and you walk to the designated uh, uh, area on court. And of course, you have to walk in on the proper side of the court like indicated by the referee uh, at the beginning of the tournament. And you stand on the single line of the court with your back to the umpire's chairs and also on the side of the umpire chair. The umpires stand with their feet on either side of the short service line. So, back to the, sir, the, the umpire's chair, umpire standing with both feet on each side of the short service line, and the service judge stand between the umpire and the net. So that's where you stand. Now it is shown here in the picture where you would stand. Now I know both of these gentlemen and that picture is not a real picture in the sense that I think there's been a little Photoshop there because they're a lot taller than that and less thick than that. So that picture is not really, if you meet those gentlemen, you might be surprised that they are much taller than that. Now, as far as your hand goes, at BWF, you see them here with their hand in front, but there's no rule if their hands are in front or behind. What we are asking, though, is that it'll be the same between both. So whoever put their hands first, if it's in front, the other guy should go in front also. And if it's in back, you can go in back both. Maybe it's something that you want to talk off court before you walk on. This might be something that you want to discuss with your umpire, between the umpire and the service judge, just to be sure that you're the same when you arrive there. Now, after the umpire and the service judge have shaken hand uh, with the players prior to the toss, the service judge immediately goes across the court, but on the opposite side of the net of where they were standing. And if you have questions why, it's most of the time there is a camera on the opposite side of the net and you don't want to be 
getting in the shot of the camera filming the toss. So therefore you take a step back after you shake hands and you just go around the post and on the other side net uh, to the opposite side and then stand in front of the service judge chair and get shuttle ready for player warm up. That's the job of the service judge. Now you go across, stand in front of the service judge chair, get a couple of shuttle ready. If it's double, one shuttle if it is single, just for the warm. -up. To conduct the toss, the umpire is asked to take one step forward more in the court. And then once you step forward, you ensure that the players don't start to warm up. As a service judge, I won't even pass the shuttle if a player comes to me, if the toss hasn't been done yet. I'm gonna wait for the toss to be done before I give the shuttle as a service judge. Now, when the toss is done, uh, be sure that all the players are there. In double, that's very often, they leave one player there and the other player leaves, no. If there's one player on one side of the net and the other one there, just indicate the player to come over to your side. You want to try to have the team on each side of you. And when you do the toss, you want to hold the coin forward, a little bit lower with an angle and hold it there and show it to the winning side and the losing side. And even if there's a camera there, I would even leave my hand open even if there's no camera there, there's a, a very often a camera outside the court watching this anyway. So you just hold it open with a, your hand with an angle type of thing so the camera can see what, the, the, what is the result of the toss. Now, you do not turn around um, the toss. After the toss, you've decided, you've said uh, who's serving and who's receiving and all that do not turn around and face the umpire chair while conducting the toss either. You cannot, you stay facing the court basically. You just took a step inside and you remain facing that way. Do not let the coin fall on the floor or drop on the floor. If that happened, then you have to start over. You don't take the result of whatever is on the court. You need to get the, the coin and start over again. Like I said before, clearly indicate who won, uh, who has won the toss. The umpire should get into the umpire chair immediately after the toss is done. Okay, you don't wait on court. You don't fill paper on court before you get in the chair. As soon as the toss is done, you get onto your chair. And because, uh, and you don't touch the, the, the player's equipment, uh, bags, uh, box, anything like that. You just climb in the chair and as soon as you sit in the chair, that's when the two minute warm up time starts. Sorry, Gerard. Yes. Uh, Kelvin, Kelvin have a comment on this. Oh, uh, good evening, Kelvin. Thank you for joining us. And if I say any foolishness, please uh, let me know. And uh, uh, will will uh, you can correct me? Good evening, everyone. So far, um, comments have been on point and true. Uh, just um, just to add to your comments there in relation to when the players are standing waiting for the toss to be conducted, try to ensure that they are not blocking um, the umpire or potentially the camera that might be in front of them. So the tendency is to try to create. A little corridor in front of you towards any camera that may be there uh, and as i will say we are practicing for the real thing to happen one of these days so if we do it all the same way when you do get the camera on court it will be a natural um position for you to take thank you, thank you Gail. now uh the two minute uh, warm-up time of course start as soon as you sit in the chair and the two minutes should finish with love all play now we all know that there's a little uh, sometime it's hard to calculate so 
basically we say at one minute 20 seconds between 120 and 130 depending you you kind of know your players you can you kind of stop the warm-up so to be sure that at two minutes you can say love all play sometime when there is camera there they're saying that they want the full two minutes you might get directions for that with uh, the uh, referee of the tournament. So if that's the case, then you follow whatever the referee tells you to do. Sometimes they say full, uh, also um, uh, the breaks at 11 or the intervals between the match. Sometimes they tell you they, they are mandatory. So you have to take the full two minutes, even if the players are ready. You have to ask them to wait. And most players are very understandable. Uh, once you're on the chair, be sure to take a few seconds to look around to be sure that everything is correct. You can see that uh, the line judge may sometime or their chairs are not correctly aligned or something like that uh, because of double and single. Uh, sometime you see that, uh, I don't know, any type of things. Uh, that's where also I check for maybe there's uh, something left back from the previous uh, match on court. And then I would before be sure that it is all uh, corrected before you start your own match. The service judge only sit down on his chair when the umpire sit on his or her chair. Okay. The service judge don't sit down before the umpire, basically. You should always have your stopwatch ready to record any interruption of play, as, such as injury, suspension of play, anything that happened, your stopwatch need to be ready to get started at all time. Now, uh, do not have your stopwatch also hanging around your neck. Uh, I know it's used to be uh, okayed in the past years, uh, a few years back. Uh, if you're as old as me and been doing that for as long as me and Kelvin, it used to be okay to have a stopwatch around the neck. Now they're trying to get less visible as possible. So just a plain wristwatch with a stopwatch on it is more than adequate. Uh, your yellow and red card also should not be visible. I know it is challenging. I've seen ladies with dresses and also, like I said earlier, they now give us shirt for tournaments with no pocket. We've been complaining at every tournament, but like I said earlier, Kelvin, I think uh, they don't want to spend the extra $2 there for get to get a pocket on. So, uh, Sorry, Gerard. Uh, we have a, a comment, a question from Kevin Ban. Uh, Kevin, please. Hi, uh, I just want to know what's the consensus from BWF assessors on using stopwatch uh, during intervals? Because I've been told some uh, prefer just to use the tablet. So do you prefer, should we just stick with the tablet or should we also start our own stopwatches during intervals? I'm going to let Kelvin answer that one. Uh, BWF assessor is his hat. Uh, yeah, thanks ahead, for that Kelvin. question, um, Kevin. Um, and yes. Um, you are correct. The comment is once you are at a tournament where there is a scoring machine, the scoring machine has a stopwatch built into it, and you are required to use the stopwatch that's on the machine as opposed to your own personal um, stopwatch. For the interval, but uh, Kelvin, uh, for an injury, for example, or a stop of play or something like that, then you, you would use your uh, yes, software. because um, that's one of the things that's being requested of the, um, the software developer to actually give us um, a stopwatch which you can access at all times, right? But that's not um, the situation right now. But um, during, during um, the interval, the stopwatch on the machine is what you'll be asked to use. So basically, you use your own stopwatch for the first two minutes of the match because by the time sometime that you get onto your chair, that's when you start. And then uh, by the time you entry everything in the tablet, 
uh, it's hard to stop start the stopwatch then. So uh, beginning of the match and then injuries and the suspension of play and different things like that. But intervals for sure, tablet. I've talked about uh, the stop watching from your neck, your cards, yes. Uh, uh, I know it's hard sometimes uh, to, uh, because I've been in tournaments and your cards are in your pocket, it's really hard to access your cards from your pocket, but that's what it is. Uh, I had ladies with no pockets on their, on their dresses sometime. So that's why I think, like I said earlier, less and less at the world level, we have uh, ladies umpire uh, with skirt on. So uh, uh, that's why probably we have even more ladies now wearing trousers or, or pants as an umpire because you don't want your card to be visible. Use an open-ended method where the numbers of the score are written down after each rally. So basically, they want us to write every score at the end of every rally. Don't wait a couple of rally before you start writing score down. The score is entered in double row of box, one row for each playing side, with only one score per vertical pair of box. So basically, every time we look down on the score sheet, there should always be only one number because every box is for every serve that is happening. Every time there's a serve, there's a new box going to happen. Every time there's a play, basically. Each vertical pair represent one rally. Oh, this is what I just said. This give an easy to read method to determine which side have won the rally and is uh, having the right to serve. As the serving side is always the one with the score in front, except at the beginning of the game, uh, ahead by one vertical box block. So basically, uh, you can know who is serving just by looking how far the last score you've put, that's the person who is uh, serving, like I said, except at the beginning of the, the, the game, and the match. But you will, uh, we'll go over that in a little while here. If a game fills one double row, the score are continue in the next double row. The score should be entered with clear, precise number because it needed to be read again, maybe by referees, and other uh, tournament uh, officials uh, uh, in the future. So you need to be, uh, your numbers need to be as, as uh, readable as possible. Remember the score sheet <coughs> is a tool to assist the umpire in, and in the moment of panic when the exact situation is not clearly Remember, your score sheet is like your memory. So you should be able to go back there. It should, it should be as legible as possible uh, to reduce a chance of making an error. It also uh, should be ready uh, and, legible and legible to assist the referee to make a decision in case of an appeal. So that is very important, like I said, to be as neat as possible on your score sheet. Here is an example of a score sheet in single. You see that every vertical row is for the next point and a horizontal row is for the player who is serving. In double, as you can see, it will change as you go up and down <clears throat> on the horizontal just to indicate which player of that team is now serving. <clears throat> you see also that the first score uh, then announce the score with the heads up and your voice be projected. You don't want us, you don't want to read your score sheet as you announce the score. You want to have your head up and 
project your voice as much as possible. Pre-match detail to be complete uh, if they're not complete by the computer. And that is something that you would try, to, like the name of the players and stuff. You try to do that in as much as possible in the waiting area. Of course, you don't know the result of the toss, but you know your players and your player's name and so on. If they're not on the score sheet, that you can put on. Uh, <clears throat> you've seen S and R on the score sheet. If I go back, oops, you see an S and an R in the double, for example, and you see an S in the single. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. S and R is for server and receiver. You need to fill it in uh, when you conduct the toss after the, sing, uh, the side have exercised their choice. Then you can uh, in single mark the server. In single, you mark only server. In doubles, that's when you mark the server and the receiver. L and R is for uh, who is going to be on your left and who's going to be on your right. And it's from when the umpire is stand or sitting in his chair, not standing on his chair, but sitting on his chair. When the umpire is sitting on his chair, whichever team is going to end up being on his right or his left, that's what you indicate with the L or the R. If we go back again, it's not there on this example. It, we see it further down. I'll show you later for just to uh, be sure that you notice. The mark zero again, uh, initial server. Is... So, sorry, sorry, Gerard. <laughs> uh, Kelvin, Kelvin has a comment. Go ahead, Kelvin. You can talk anytime. Kelvin, cut me if you need to. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll just interrupt you. I won't cut you. No, 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 no. So go ahead. No All worry. Right. Again, just um, to share some information um, about the toss. Um, when um, it has been decided who will serve and who will receive. It's not... Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not that we want to encourage the practice, but there's nothing wrong with if an umpire wants to take his pen out and make a quick mark on a sheet as to who the server and who the receiver might be, so that when you actually get up into the chair, you know, in that moment, um, when we all feel, you know, the, the pressures of the moment, that you are sure who the server and the receiver is. So, you know, Yes, you're expected to try to remember the names of all the players and all of that, but you know, don't don't feel that like you're doing something wrong if you want to take a quick moment to make an indication on your score sheet as to who um, who who has won, who's going to serve, who's going to receive. Thank you. Yeah, it's much better to do that than to arrive on the chair and don't know or don't remember, not sure who's on right, who's on left, who's serving, and who's receiving. Uh, that is much much worse then taking that little extra second, like Kelvin said, and do a little uh, quick mark on your score sheet. Uh, so the zero uh, is a mark against uh, initial server and initial receiver at the start of each game. So you put the zero on your score sheet. A start time, note the time when the umpire announced play. Now you're telling me, how am I going to write the time, say play, watch the game, get my score sheet, and everything at the same time? I have a little trick that I do that I'm going to share with you when it's score sheet. When it's the pad, as soon as you push play, it starts by itself the time is going to be there if we're using the pads. But if you're using a score sheet, when you say play, the time won't magically appear on your score sheet. So what I do when I'm sitting in the chair, I know they're warming up for two minutes. So I look at my time and I add two minutes to that. And that's the time of the start of the match. That's a little trick that I do. It's save uh, you of losing contact with the play 
for a little minute there when you say play, because when you say play, either with the pad or with the score sheet, when you say play, your head need to be up and you need to be watching the uh, uh, receiver if you have a, a service judge. You need to focus on the receiver. So if you're pushing and saying play at the same time you push, you're not watching the receiver. If you're writing on your score sheet when you say play, you're not watching the receiver when you say play. When you say play, you're ready. And believe me, there's lots of players that when you say play, bing, it's gone. Okay? Especially if the receiver is ready. So be careful about that. Uh, note, the shuttle used during a match, uh, you have to note those shuttle. There's a place on the score sheet. On the pad, there is a, a little touch area that you will add shuttle as they are passed out. Starting with uh, the warm-up shuttle also. If you issue new shuttle for warm-up, they should be uh, marked as shuttle of, uh, that you've been using in the match. During play, uh, write the new score in the next available box in the row of the next server's name. I think we covered that a little bit earlier. If you have questions about that, uh, uh, we can talk about it. In double, the players, uh, the players of the receiving side shall not change their respective service score until they win a point on their service. So basically you all know this, you only, in double, you only change service courts side when it's your service and you score. Basically you guys know that. I hope you do. When a side lose the right to serve, the player who was serving at that time shall continue to be in the same service court from where he last served until his side gain right to serve again and win a point. Example, in double player D serve from the right service court when the score was 6-4 and their side lost the rally. So he will continue to be on the right service court until his side win a point and gain the right to serve again, thus when the score became 7-6, the player C will serve from the left service score. I know that sounds confusing, but you guys all played double before, and I think you do understand when to change side and so on. If the receiving side win the point to make it service over, right their new score in the next available box. Last completed box is always the side serving. And we did say that and mentioned that earlier. Score level at 20 all, you need to draw a diagonal line in the next available box. So basically you need to draw right after 20 all in the next vertical row you write a diagonal line, one diagonal line in that next available box. If situation listed below a cure, you need to use the appropriate alphabet into the next available box in front of the appropriate players. Now, all these, if you've used a pad before, there's a little exclamation uh, uh, digit there on the pad. If you touch that, there's another screen that appear with all of these there and that will be put uh, on your score sheet. Warning is uh, you see that W fault with the F referee call on court R suspension S injury I disqualified by referee uh, D-I-S, retired, R-E-T, service court error, correct, and overrule of line judge call. 
we do not write those on the score sheet and correct me if I'm wrong here, Calvin. I think we do not write those on score sheet anymore. Court error, correct or overrule of line judge. No, you're correct. Okay, now let me hold you up. Uh, so uh, this, like I said, uh, you looked at that, it was dated uh, a, f a year back or something like that. This is correction, I guess, that BWF did not do yet on, because I just pick this document from the BWF site uh, yesterday. So uh, if it's there, it's still on the BWF page. Maybe we can make a little note of that, Kelvin. Okay, hello. Uh, also, uh, very often, I can let you guys know, most of these happen in your umpire career. Last year was my first time, and I've been umpiring a lot of years. <laughs> and last year, at a semifinal of the World uh, 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 the championship, uh, HABC World Tour Championship, was my first retired that I ever had in my Bemington umpiring career. And it happened to me on TV for the first time. So uh, believe me, it was not pretty. But everybody understood anyway, at least. I said that to you guys because I want you to imagine that it happened to you. So you can Sorry, Gerard. Yes, I will come back to you, Ricardo, because you need to, to be able to uh, think and say, okay, this might happen to me. Let's practice my vocabulary for this, for example. Yes, Ricardo. Hey, Leonardo, Leonardo Mendoza, have a question? Good. Please, Leonardo. No. Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, the question is about service uh, court error corrected and overrule of line judge call because in the next pages uh, it, it explains how to use it. So um, it it's, it would be on use this year or next year. Uh, that's that's my question. Uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Leonardo. Like I said, uh, and Kelvin agree with me, we do not <coughs> write uh, any more um, correction or overrules on score sheet. So you can uh, disregard the sections that is uh, talking about that. So now that I'm on the next page, uh, if the match has been suspended, that's where you put the S. Uh, that section, uh, the overrule section, you will uh, forget. And the correction section also that you see there, you uh, also ignore. If misconduct occur during the interval between uh, games, write the corresponding letter of the alphabet, W or F, either warning for misconduct or fault for misconduct, into the next available box, on the line of the offending player, because that can happen uh, and your score is not in favor of that player. So you don't write it where your score is, but you write it in front uh, on the line of that player that, was, uh, that did the offense. Uh, however, in a case where a red card is issued, the new score shall be noted following uh, in the next uh, in the next game, or if uh, yes, if there's a, a fault uh, issued uh, or warning issued in, at the interval, that's when you go in the next game and write your you announce a, a, a second game, for example, love all. You don't say play. You announce your uh, warning or fault if it hasn't been announced yet, and then you put it. You put your um, uh, W or F after 
uh, the double zero there, basically. End of game, right? And circle complete game score with a slash between the score. Fill in completed game score at the top of the score sheet also. Uh, mark in a zero against initial server and initial receiver at the start of the next game. Note the S and R in the case of double for the start of the next game. So basically at the end of each game, we ask you to, at the end of that line, skip a few box and then you write your score with a slash in between and circle that score. Don't forget to put your zeros uh, for the next game and then who will be serving and receiving for the next game also, you write those on your score sheet. On Sorry, Gerard. Yes. Is Guillermo uh, have a question? Guillermo, please. Guillermo. Yes, hello no, to everybody. Nice to see you. And I have a question with the uh, uh, last uh, diapo. Uh, if something happened, uh, just in case a fault happened between games, uh, for the next game, I need to call Love Old. And then I, uh, I call a fault for a player and give the reason, uh, verbal abuse, just in case. And after that, I correct the score one love and uh, restart the game and say correct yes okay thank you 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 say the new score and then after you said the new score play as if you would have given a card at any time in the game basically any time in a game it could be eight seven Okay, and then you fault someone, then it might become nine seven play. Okay, got it. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. End of match. Right and circle complete game score. So basically, at the top of your score sheet, you have to be sure that all the scores of the, the, the game that you've done for that match are there. And then you circle the complete uh, game scores. End of the time, end time also, that's when you write the time of the match ending. That is, if you have to write a time perfectly correct on a score sheet, that is the time that you have to write perfectly correct. Because there is a, a time issue in the ruling for how long a player has before he can be called on court again and play again. So we need to have that time as precise as possible. And that time should be when you call uh, the game at the end. When you say game, that's when the time should, that's where the time, should, you should take the time for that uh, match. Fill in complete game uh, score at the top of the score sheet. Circle the name of the player of the winning side at the top of the score sheet. Duration. Calculate and write the duration of the match after leaving the field of play. You don't start counting and sitting on the chair. As soon as you shook hand and announced, you get off the chair and complete your score sheet off the court. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know. Don't uh, announce anything before you shook in as a reminder. I think you guys all know that, but I'm repeating it. Uh, write appropriate detail about the situation listed in point five of during play section at the bottom of the score sheet. So that if there's any incident basically that you need to report to the referee, uh, it should be written down at the bottom of your score sheet. If the space is not sufficient there, write on the back of the score sheet uh, with a specific remark as for remark, please refer to the back of the score sheet. So if you don't have a score sheet and you have uh, the touchpad, most of the time 
the referees uh, don't want you to get every score sheet from the table and have them sign. They only want to see you if you had a situation on court. That's when you will go and get your score sheet, write whatever happened on court on that score sheet, and then go see the referee uh, for a signature and so on. Um, sign the complete score sheet and obtain a co-signature from the referee and it over the mass control. So basically what that is what I just said. Most tournament when there's a score pads there, uh, the referee don't want to see you at after each match that you do. Uh, it, you, they'll just pick up, there's nothing. And it's print out as soon as you play, as soon as you uh, uh, finish the match on your score sheet, uh, on your uh, score pad. That's when uh, everything is sent and bingo. Here is an example of a score sheet. You see a circle here where they circle the winning side. They put the score in. You see here the slash at 20 all that we've talked about. You see also at the end of a game, they didn't write here. They skipped the line and wrote there. You see here also at the end, they skipped a, a complete set of block and then wrote it there. You can skip two here and I wouldn't be offended by that. Uh, you see the end time, start time, you see also here the number of shuttles that was used. You see the R for right and the L for left that we talked about earlier. Uh, then we have S and R for server and receiver. You see the zeros here and there at the beginning. And if it would be a single match, you would only see the S you wouldn't see the R, but the zeros will still be there in a single match. Uh, don't forget at the end also to sign what I often do, just to, just not to forget. When I sit in my chair, when they're warming up, that's where I sign my score sheet. That way, I never forget to sign my score sheet. Uh, you see here that play has been suspended, the S. Uh, you see that that score sheet has been done when they were using the C and the O. So we're not doing that anymore. We see that at a couple of places. We're, we're not doing that. There's another one here and a couple here and so on. So. Uh, questions about the, oh, and you see at the bottom here, uh, for the S, they wrote at the bottom, match suspended in the second game for four minutes, 30 seconds due to power failure. And I was in a tourna uh, tournament in, uh, I can't remember which country. Anyway, it was a junior. I think we had two power audits a day. You could set your watch for it. And uh, uh, so every twice a day, play would stop basically for about half an hour. So I practiced my, uh, my S and my, uh, my language quite a bit at that tournament. I hear no question about the score sheet. I'm going to go to the next one, which is a single. You see in single that there is, the S is there already, and you see there's no R for a single match. The zeros are there, you see all of that is the same. The winner, the score, you see again the score at the end of every game circle with the slash in between. 
There's a game at 20 here. You see that again. There was a warning here. Uh, it was in uh, the second game. And the warning was issued because uh, trying to influence the line judge. So that's where the warning came from. All everything is there except the signature. <laughs> but any question on this the score sheet? Here's another example here where we have uh, players and so on, and we have a retired. Uh, we have the referee for an injury that came on in the first game, and I'm assuming that is why we have a retired here. You see how the letters are placed for uh, in this case. <clears throat> and you see that retired is written at the end of the, the, the player who was uh, retiring, even though he was leading here. Uh, he retired, so basically he lost the match. You see the writing at the bottom for both incidents, the injury in the first game and then in the second game, the situation of the retired. Here's another example of a score sheet. In double, we have uh, a player that was disqualified here. I guess that player did many fault. I'm assuming, or this fault was so imminent, so grave. I don't know if that's a word in English. I just used it anyway. So bad that it uh, result in a disqualification right there and then. So that is also showing you that you don't have to have received two faults one morning before you get disqualified. You can be disqualified at the first event if it is a event uh, that is requiring that. Now you know also that as soon as you do a fault on a court, the referee need to be uh, let know of the situation. Don't forget that. That's why here you have the F and the R right away. And I guess after a discussion with the umpire, the referee decided that it was a disqualification. The umpire would pass his black card to the umpire. The, the referee would pass the black card to the umpire and the umpire would do the announcement. Sorry, Gerard. Uh, Mohamed, have a comment? Please, Mohamed. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have one question. I know like uh, uh, when you call the referee is coming after you have like photos injury. It's like why we don't use uh, like you said before, like one block for each uh, letter or each like incidence or each uh, point. Yes. Yeah, I see because a few times like when they have fought with injury, the referee is right just right down of the situation. Yes. Calvin, you want to talk on that? Uh, can you can you just um, repeat it? Because I, I saw the well, last the last saying, part of it. He's saying that uh, why are we using uh, what are they putting as the example here? The F and R in the same row. Uh, I would put F because it's a fault that happened first. Then I call the referee. Then I would put the R in the next row. But why in this example are they one above each other? Okay, because as, as you had explained earlier, each column is supposed to represent a point or a situation. So it all happened at that particular point. Um, so you have the, um, the referee and the, um, and the fault um, taking place at that particular point. If you would put them into the adjoining box, you might get the impression maybe um, it might be a, another rally or something. So it's, it's best to try and keep them all together. So basically, BWF wants it to be one above each other like this because it is the same situation. Is that what you're saying, Calvin? Uh, yes, uh, yes. So you're, so you're clear that it's all happening at that particular rally and at that point in the, in the game. Okay, thanks. But uh, also, uh, Mohamed, I think when you use the score pad, it will print out the way BWF wants it anyway. Yeah, automatically. Yeah. Yeah. 
Gerard, uh, Max have a question. Please, Max. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, well, my question is about the announce at the end of the match when it's a return or a disqualification. How, the, how do we announce that part? Uh, that has been... Uh, Caldo, did we cover that in the first one that I wasn't there, the language, or did we miss that? Yes, in the, in the vocabulary. Uh, so just look back at the vocabulary. Yes. Yes, we did cover that, right? Yes, just have a look back at the vocabulary for the exact um, word in there. Yes. Okay, well, in my case, if, because I entered too late, so I can, I can hear you that part. Yes, it was, a, uh, it was um, in the first, first session, I think, Calvin, or the second one? Just to help Sorry, Max here. Yes, Max, just to help you, you can go to our YouTube channel, Badminton Panam YouTube channel, and you look for Talking About Rules, a playlist, and there are posts all our past meetings, and you look for the one which topic is vocabulary, and there is all cover. Okay, thank you. Okay. So basically, you would raise your right, uh, your right hand with the black card. You would say player's name. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's call him player C, disqualified. Uh, match won by player whatever. And then the score. OK, OK, got it. I hope that answered your question, uh, Max. So Ricardo, before we start the next uh, section, that will uh, go on before the match here. We just finished the score sheets. It's an hour and 15 minutes in. I say that uh, we can go to questions if other people have questions and then uh, we call it an evening, uh, for me anyway, uh, on a, if you're okay with that, Ricardo. Yes, I'm okay with that. I think we have covered a lot of, of these documents, almost the, the half, the half. Yeah. So we can open now the questions and answers part. Maybe we can discuss about these all points that you already talk and go through. I don't know if somebody wants to, to share experience or about videos, tournaments that they were attending that some kind of uh, some issues happens with the score sheets. As an example, um, in this, as an example in this document, you mentioned that the umpires have to take care uh, in the way that they write the numbers. When we are on the desk working in our tournaments, we receive a lot of a lot of a lot of score sheets, and in some in some times are very difficult to read. But we say, okay, I need to, please explain me. I know everybody is in a rush. Maybe we don't have enough umpires and they are nervous because is they are being in a session. But, but it's very important to have to mention this because it will be easy, the work for everyone. And also, and also you have to take, to take notes about this. If you go for another tournament out of, out of our continent, no? So I just want to mention that. And uh, Ricardo, you would know that as a referee, you probably saw a lot of uh, different handwriting. Yes, also, also as a referee, it's, it's different, no? Because you have to, you have to, um, to ask to the umpire to 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 write the the proper issue that happened on court, as you mentioned, no. And in some cases, it's these comments must be recorded in the software just for BWF report. And <laughs> yes, it's very difficult in in most of the cases, and also because you know. And no, everybody talks English. No, everybody talks Spanish. It's the same for the writing. So it's tricky. It's a tricky, a tricky short. Yes. <clears throat> so anyone 
wants to comment something about these topics that we covered today? Yeah, Ricardo, I just, just want to uh, again share, since we are talking about the wind-up of the match there, uh, just to remind um, um, the umpires that we do not want to see them tanking the fellow service judge and lines judges while they are in the chair at the end of the match. So at the end of the match, make your announcement out of the chair, join your um, team on court and march off court. And when you're then out of the view of spectators in the, off the field of play, that is where you can then, um, you know, acknowledge and thank um, the members of your team that just came off court with you. Right, so just, just to reiterate, so you, won't, you wouldn't do that from in the chair, you'll do that when you're back out, out of the field of play. Yes, thank you, Calvin. So anyone has any comment, please, is the time to share your experience with us, uh, with everybody. See, that's, thank you. That, that means that, that me and Kelvin are very, very good. And you don't have a question that because we are so clear, it's incredible. <laughs> I just. One question. Okay, Max, please. It's Diane. Diane, have a question. Okay, sorry. Diane, please feel free to share. Okay, thank you. Hi, Gerald. Hi, Diane. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a dot uh, about the toss, okay? You said that when the, the coin falls, we have to, to do the toss again, okay? Right? Yes. But I had a situation this year when I let the unfortunately I let the the coin falls and I picked it up and did the mm -hmm. toss again and the assessor told me that I couldn't do it. He said that I had to to see the coin on the floor and that's the the result of the toss what's your uh what i can do in this situation what well, i have to do you know you know my answer i'm gonna ask kelvin his answer and uh and see what he's gonna say on that yeah well in a situation um and then where the coin falls to the floor in front of you there and you can actually see um, you know what the situation was. You can go with, with the call last there, or you then have to explain to the players that um, you know that you're you're going to do the toss again. But if if it's a, if it has fallen there in front of you, um, then you, you can go with with what is there in front of you, right? Yes. It, at uh, I can tell you. Uh, uh, Diana, uh, that uh, the, at the major tournament I was in uh, last summer, uh, the Japan Open, okay, mm -hmm. it was clear uh, and we had uh, people doing a toss uh, in the finals. Uh, the referee said that if the coin fall, you toss again. So, okay. you see, uh it was uh, a little bit different there but sometime very often uh, when the coin fall you would see a player that will step on it and that for sure for me would be intervening with the toss so for sure there i would toss again okay uh me i wouldn't uh, i would not uh take points away because you have to toss again i wouldn't <laughs> take points away 
<laughs> okay, thank you. But that is me. Okay. Kelvin, something to add on that? No, well, again, um, as you said, the important thing there as well is that um, you have to listen to the instructions given to given by the referee at the briefing um, because you know they may have a specific um, instruction um, to give to you um, in relation to that particular event that you're at. So it's, it's important to, as Gerald said, follow the instructions given by the referee at the time. Yeah. I mean, just just to make a joke of it, um, you know, there the, there was a time when television actually asked us to let the coin fall on the ground, you know, and that sent us all scampering to try to get a coin that was not a wrong coin, so that when it did fall on the ground, that it wouldn't roll across the court, right? So you know, that that was just um, something from the past. I don't want any comment about the COVID-19. I don't want comment about uh, the, how nice and warm is your country compared to mine. I don't want any comments like that. The only comments we want is regarding Bennington. Uh, uh, Sandeep, just, just write that there is a uh, rolling across the court has happened in French open a couple of years ago that the coin roll across the court you're saying yes and and what did the umpire toss it again or use the one on the ground okay he said that the umpire have a second coin a second coin okay backup coin yeah, there was a there was a question. Was it Mohammed who was asking about the IPTOs? Um, what I had attempted to do the very first session was to try to give information where um, this information um, could be accessed uh, from the BWF site because it's important um, to go there and you know check um, for information um, so that you don't have to rely on that information being shared here. Um, so if you can go back to the, the PowerPoint presentation from the very first um, session that we had, you will see some, some direction there as to where you will find the various um, bit of information that we are sharing here with you. Uh, some of it is in the Empire section, um, some of it is on the um, corporate. So look back at that first um, slide and you will get that information. There. I know that. Diane, that it might not be the, the perfect answer to what you were looking for, but uh, that is the best answer we have today. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Also, uh, is, we really appreciate your participation. I, I think maybe we are about to, to finish this meeting for today. And we have uh, almost 40 pages more to, to cover in our next meeting. Uh, thank you to all to participate as always. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Kelvin, for your input. Our, your experience is very important for us. And I know every time that we go through the regulations and instructions, always something new appear. Always we learn something new and it's very important to keep updated uh, for those who are going for certification next year. Uh, we hope that this kind of uh, activities help to you to improve your knowledge and go to the assessment prepared. And for those ones who are thinking to go for the certification in next years also. And if anyone have another comment, is welcome. If not, thank you all. And Gerard, please, your finals, final words. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your indulgement. Uh, I know sometime I, uh, the French guy trying to speak to uh, Spanish or, 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 or uh, Portuguese uh, people in English 
sometime <laughs> it, it might come out uh, differently, but I think we can manage to understand each other. So thank you very much for your indulgement and I'm gonna see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you everybody. So next meeting for referees will be next week uh, and the for umpires will be in two weeks. If you want to participate uh, in the referees meeting, please let me know by a message and then we will invite you, okay? Thank you to all and see you next talking about rules. A Badminton Panam Technical Officials Conference.